I'd like to welcome you now to our second panel, uh, which is going to broaden the lens a little bit so that we can talk about the regional and international implications of Iranian-Azerbaijani relations. Um, unfortunately, as you heard, one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Lu Shang, is not feeling well and is not able to join us today, so we're going to have a slightly abbreviated panel here, which hopefully will leave a little bit more time um, for discussion. I think, again, we'll just go um, along the order that we have printed on the program here, so let me turn the floor over to our our first speaker, uh, Sergei Markadonov, who's a visiting fellow in the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I see this event uh, has a great interest because of many people here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make presentation today. Uh, huge topic. Iranian-Azerbaijanian uh, relations and their uh, implication for their regional and international security. I am going to concentrate on uh, three basic uh, topics. The first one, general trends in the uh, security developments uh, in the uh, South Caucasus for recent year. Uh, the uh, role of Iran, because uh, Iranian topic produced uh, many hard discussions and estimates for previous panel, but some of them uh, were missed. It's, it's necessary to return to them and estimate. And then I'm going to stress on the, uh, Russia's role in the regional security and its attitude to uh, the South Caucasus uh, as whole and Iranian engagement in uh, the development of the region. Uh, since uh, 2008, we have been witnesses of the shaping new status quo in the South Caucasus. The first status quo was formed there after the USSR collapse, and uh, it uh, provoked uh, many ethnic uh, conflicts and instability. Just today, uh, the South Caucasus is one of uh, the most unstable and unpredictable regions in uh, the former USSR area. Six of eight ethno-political conflicts uh, have uh, taken place here, and three or four de facto states are still existing in this region. Uh, but uh, after the events of 2008, with recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia by Russia, many problems uh, were transformed. And now we are witnesses of new status quo shaping, with new role of Russia, with the uh, uh, suspended uh, cooperation between uh, the countries of the region and NATO and uh, some other uh, very important uh, influences, especially Arab Spring after 2011. And here it's uh, necessary to pay special attention to the uh, role of Iran. Just today the Iranian problem stands out on the international agenda, but uh, it's much broader and more diverse than Iran's desire to acquire a nuclear bomb. Speaking about the Iranian engagement in the South Caucasus, it's necessary to understand that this area is not front line for the Iranian foreign policy. It's kind of backyard, because front line is the Gulf region and the Middle East as whole. As for the Caucasus, uh, of course, uh, the uh, role of Iran is very interesting, but especially interesting and crucially important uh, in terms of uh, possible transfer of Middle East challenges and problems in the Caucasus territory. It's interesting to especially stress that Iranian foreign policy looks like a combination of pragmatic approach on the one side and a loud revolutionary rhetoric on another side. Uh, one factor was missed for previous uh, presentations, uh, previous panel. Uh, I mean here the cooperation between Azerbaijan and Israel. It uh, has a special concern for the Iranian foreign policy. And Iran is uh, specially concerned by the penetration of non-regional actors in the region. For Iran, regional actors are Iran itself, of course, Turkey and Russia. And it's not coincidence that after events of 2008, Tehran proposed after the uh, Turkish initiative, uh, its own initiative, 3 plus 3, meaning here the cooperation between three uh, countries of the region, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and uh, Armenia, and uh, three neighboring countries uh, having historical uh, impact on the development of the Caucasus, Russia, uh, Turkey, and uh, Iran itself. Uh, and. Uh, um, 
Just today, the uh, most important challenge considered by Iran is penetration of uh, international actors. This is why Iran is the only country which is protesting or criticizing the updated Madrid principles, because one of the points of uh, the updated Madrid principles uh, recommended the presence of international peacekeepers. Who would be uh, those peacekeepers? Americans, Europeans, and so on. For Iran, it's a kind of uh, concern, and this penetration is considered like a threat. Uh, what's about Russia and Russian estimates of uh, the uh, Caucasus security uh, issues as whole well, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iran, Iranian engagement? As for uh, Russian-Iranian relations, they are not limited by the Caucasus, of course. They uh, have a much broader context, but in the Caucasus, uh, uh, they mention uh, those relationships are very uh, important because don't forget that for two uh, military campaigns in Chechnya, Iran supported the territorial integrity of Russia and even for the uh, second campaign when Iran was a chair of uh, Organization of Islamic Conference, Iran uh, supported the Russian position in the situation and especially stressed that uh, his, uh, it's, uh, it was not dealing with uh, separatists or uh, Islamic uh, extremists, radicals uh, connected with the Sunni direction of uh, Islam. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, it's impossible to uh, overestimate uh, the uh, relationship between Moscow and Tehran because uh, there are some uh, problems in, the, uh, in, in terms of the Caspian Sea uh, partition and delimitation, first of all. It's uh, the most important issue. And uh, there is a specific uh, concern of Iran. It's very, uh, to, to Russia, of course, it's very different from the perceptions of Russia in the West, because uh, in the West, uh, many experts and policymakers are afraid of strong Russia. But Iran is afraid of weak Russia which would be controlled by the West, and uh, there is a specific fear that Russia would be kind of puppet figure of the West, and Putin would be ki kind of puddle or puppet figure of uh, the Western policymakers. Uh, as for uh, Russian uh, policy, uh, let me uh, go back to events of 2008. That time uh, here, the uh, most popular question was about the next the next victim of Russian ambitions and uh, so on. The uh, future prospects of Ukraine or Azerbaijan or Moldova were discussed that time, but uh, for me personally, that time and nowadays uh, it wasn't. It is now clear that uh, for uh, revisionism, Russia has had no uh, uh, sufficient resources. This is why Russian policy in the Caucasus today could be characterized like selective revisionism. Russia preferred uh, to be a status quo power before uh, 2008, and uh, facing the uh, unfreezing of, of the conflict uh, between 2004-2008, Russia changed uh, this approach uh, only in the Georgian direction, not in the direction of Azerbaijan, Armenia, or some other countries of uh, the post-Soviet space as whole or the South Caucasus. Just today, speaking about the Armenian and Azerbaijani relations uh, and Russian approach, uh, this policy could be uh, considered like swing policy. Because Russia, recognizing uh, the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, lost many resources for direct uh, impact or even pressure on Georgia. On the one side, Russia could be considered as a winner in uh, events of 2008 because uh, the NATO cooperation with Georgia was uh, practically suspended. Of course, rhetoric is brilliant and many promises, but no concrete deadlines and uh, concrete dynamics around. Uh, and uh, Russia demonstrated that uh, for uh, this country it was impossible to violate its own uh, national interests. Uh, but on the other side, uh, it's kind of uh, loss of uh, influence on Georgia and uh, problems with the uh, relationship uh, with the West. Of course, they are not so uh, tough right now, but those, uh, those uh, 
contradictions uh, are still are still existing. This is why Russia is interested to uh, have uh, more or less reliable relations in both countries, in uh, Armenia and uh, with uh, with Azerbaijan. Russian opposition to Nagorno-Karabakh resolution is very different from approach to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which were recognized like independent states. As for Nagorno-Karabakh, Russia is, is not ready to recognize this entity. Moreover, uh, Russian representatives uh, for the uh, electoral campaigns in this de facto state uh, practically every time uh, uh, didn't recognize the electoral campaigns themselves, not only uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic as a uh, non-recognized entity. I mean here, uh, presidential election in Nagorno-Karabakh Republic previous year and so on, there were many statements stressing the Russian position on territorial integrity of uh, Azerbaijan. At the same time, uh, Armenia is considered as uh, one of the most important military, political allies of Russia in the South Caucasus. Don't forget about base located in Gumri and uh, common cooperation of two uh, border uh, guard uh, services of uh, Russia and Armenia and Russian military presence in the, this republic. But, uh, um, at the same time, I uh, could not uh, characterize uh, the relationship between Russia and Armenia like complete honeymoon. Because there is a problem of Eurasian Union and there is a problem of uh, different perceptions of Yerevan by the uh, strategic cooperation with Russia. Uh, Yerevan is very interested to have uh, military support of Russia and cooperation in the framework of uh, uh, CSTO. Very interested. But as for Eurasian Union or Custom Union, uh, there is no such interest because uh, with a no sharing common border uh, idea to have a Custom Union looks like ambiguous, at least. Uh, this is why uh, Yerevan is not uh, seriously eager to uh, accelerate the process of uh, joining uh, the, Eurasian, the Eurasian Union and Custom Union. It's also considered like a challenge uh, in Moscow. Moscow is not uh, completely satisfied the level of uh, cooperation between Armenia and NATO. It's an interesting question, by the way, because uh, speaking about uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, we could not uh, conclude only about uh, regional arms raising or Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. There is uh, also competition for NATO. There is another direction, competition for Russia. And because in uh, terms of this competition, Yerevan is not uh, interested to lose its uh, influence or even simple connections between uh, Armenia and NATO and to uh, liberate this territory for Azerbaijan and for Azerbaijani activity. This is why uh, practically uh, two countries uh, in parallel uh, realize uh, the uh, goal to uh, have uh, more uh, cooperations with uh, NATO, European Union. In Russia, it's also considered not like threat, but with the no uh, satisfactions. Uh, now let me uh, let me finish, and uh, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there are many other uh, other issues, and uh, I hope to uh, have your uh, questions for the QA uh, session. And there, I. I'm going to be more, more detailed with the information which uh, would be interesting for you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. Um, our second speaker is uh, Nigar Guksel, who is the editor-in-chief of the Turkish Policy Quarterly and is going to talk about uh, the Turkish perspective on Iranian-Azeri relations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually going to start by uh, underlining something that Mr. Markedonov said, in that when he was um, talking about Iran's uh, areas, the, which area is significant for Iran most, he said that, uh, that the Caucasus is a secondary and the Middle East is, is primary. And I would say actually in Turkish-Iran relations as well, particularly now, 
the Middle East is much more the scene of, um, of, of rivalry versus uh, cooperation, and the Caucasus is, is somewhat uh, in the back burner. And this is also just because of the conjectural, the Arab Spring, and, and, um, and sort of where the world is also uh, more focused nowadays. Um, but in my talk uh, today, I'm going to focus more, obviously, on uh, Turkey and Iran as it relates to, to the Caucasus. Uh, traditionally, Turkey's added value, at least for its, uh, for its traditional allies uh, in the Caucasus, has been its ability to, uh, to counterbalance Iran and, 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 uh, and Russia. Uh, for Azerbaijan and, and Georgia in particular, it was Turkey's ability to extend the Western strategic uh, reassurance uh, to, to the Caucasus. I think sort of the, the, the single most tangible demonstration of this role was uh, in the Baku Jehan, Tbilisi, Baku Tbilisi Jehan, sorry, oil pipeline. Uh, but for Azerbaijan, there was another uh, case that was symbolically, I think, demonstrative in which in 2001, uh, when Iranian warships were threatening uh, vessels of Azerbaijan or related to Azerbaijan in the Caspian, Turkey had a, a military exercise over the Caspian Sea, sort of driving home the message that, um, uh, that, that Turkey's there uh, uh, if need be. Um, and symbolically, I think this, this made a, strain, a strong statement. Um, but then there was a period where, where Turkey seemed to shift, starting from 2006, but particularly between 2008 and 2011, you see Turkey acting uh, at critical junctures more in line uh, with, with, the West, uh, with the Russian and, and Iranian uh, uh, perspectives in, in certain instances as opposed to the Western ones. This was the case in uh, the NATO efforts to... Um, penetrate or be present in the Black Sea. It was obviously the case in the, in the, um, uh, the procedures, the, 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 the period in which NATO's nuclear capabilities were on the agenda and Turkey was um, sort of playing the role of a spoiler in, in Western perspectives. Um, uh, it was also obviously, a dimension of this was also the spoiling of, of Turkey-Israel uh, relations. Um, uh, and, um, and from Azerbaijan's perspective, the Turkey-Armenia uh, rapprochement actually played directly into this sort of shifting axis uh, picture. Uh, and ultimately, uh, from the perspective of Azerbaijan, the souring of Turkey-Azerbaijan relations can only play directly into the hands of, of Iran and, uh, and Russia, in particular on issues that are of strategic significance for the West, such as a southern corridor for natural gas or, 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 or stronger um, U.S. or NATO presence in the Caucasus. So the axis at, at that period uh, seemed to, to get off uh, track uh, when we look at um, the strategic alignments. Since 2011, we can say that Turkey has conjecturally, at least, realigned with its traditional uh, bloc. Uh, why? I, I think well, I sort of underlined conjectural because I don't think it's necessarily uh, uh, um, something that uh, is, can be taken for granted. Uh, I think Turkey's efforts uh, of mediation or of um, creating multilateral platforms of cooperation, uh, most of them uh, fizzled. Uh, Turkey's efforts to guide Egypt or Syria into one direction or another also didn't seem to uh, yield results. I think Turkey had a reality check as to what it could do alone. Um, and it became clear that Iran and Russia were not necessarily interested in Turkey expanding its own influence in the areas that they see as their primary areas of, of, of influence. Um, uh, it was clear that sectarian and ethnic divisions in the region were going to um, um, drag Turkey perhaps into them or, or create problems for Turkey that Turkey would have a hard time dealing with without a Western <coughs> umbrella. Uh, and, and I think it also became clear that the, that the new partners that Turkey was um, uh, courting, uh, the relationship with them was going to be more fickle and less reliable uh, uh, than would be worth losing the benefits of the traditional allies. And in this case, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey, the re restoration of Azerbaijan, Turkey relationships, or the strengthening of it, and the derailment of the Turkey-Armenia process, I think is directly related to this recalculation of, of, of cost versus benefit of this new uh, track. Um, so the Armenian normalization process was, was, was shelved. Uh, the Obama-Erdogan relationship got sort of even a stronger collaboration uh, uh, climate. 
um, Turkey's accepting to host the uh, early warning uh, uh, station of the missile defense shield of NATO was an important um, milestone in that sense, something that bothered Iran significantly as well as Russia most probably. Um, the, uh, the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline project uh, was uh, um, decided upon and uh, um, put into action, let's say, in this period with this realignment. Uh, so that would carry at least Azerbaijani natural gas to, to Europe. Um, and, and the response by Iran, and I'll focus more on Iran because uh, this is not about Russia necessarily, has been thinly veiled threats uh, towards Azerbaijan and Turkey. Um, thinly veiled, I must say. But one can say that there's another with Israel's apology as well. You know, you have this sort of appearance of, the, of uh, going back to where we were um, five years ago, before five years ago, with Turkey, Israel, Azerbaijan, uh, the United States uh, on, on one side, and Ar Armenia, Iran, uh, Russia on the other. You, so you, you, can, you can see it that way if one uh, looks at it with this, within these, uh, these changes. I would definitely argue that this is conjectural, though, and I think it's important to keep that in mind, and that there's still, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, mm, Possibilities for change much more than one would expect, have expected in the past. There's a very strong Western skepticism in Turkey. It's not going away. Um, there's a sense of double standards um, uh, and sort of a normative dis uncredibility about uh, the EU in particular, but also the United States. Trust is a big problem. Um, there's a perception of a declining West. Um, the economic situation has, has fed into that with the Turkey's economy going well and the West having crisis. Um, uh, there's a sense of impotence, that the West has been impotent in dealing with Russia, in dealing with the Middle East, and that you, know, you don't necessarily want to side uh, with, with, a, with a power, with a bloc that's not on the winning side. I think Turkey still has a strong sense of vulnerability towards its neighbors, be it Iran or, or Russia, where you, you, you don't, Turkey does not want to uh, confront them. Uh, 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 Turkey still has a problem with, uh, in reconciling the, uh, with the Turk Kurdish problem, and that seems like it'll take some time. There's a vulnerability in the country. Um, uh, you know, I think long-term interests, Turkey's interests do align with the West in terms of open borders, resolved conflicts, um, better governance in the region. But in the short term, in any given time, any, the political leadership may not be in, in alignment with, with Western interests. And you also have the public opinion and that you, you don't have these blocks that we were just talking about really reflected in the public opinion in Turkey. Azerbaijan is, yes, by far, uh, or, or not, well, yes, by far in many cases, the leading uh, country in Turkey's sort of uh, the public opinion's positive view, but Iran is not far behind. And when you look at the questions asked to Turkey, who is your number one threat, it's United States by far, like 40-something percent United States, 3-something percent Iran. Uh, you also look at the transatlantic trends of the German Marshall Fund. Turkey is actually, the Turkish population is much less critical of Iran than Russia is. So, you know, when, when, when asked, you know, what should, what should the response be, Turkey, the plurality of Turks uh, say that, uh, Turkey, that Iran should just be allowed to develop nuclear weapons, whereas the, Russian, the plurality of the Russian responses is that economic sanctions should be, uh, should be uh, implemented. So I think, you know, in terms of public opinion, uh, one can't take uh, that these strategic um, uh, divisions are going to uh, necessarily continue. Um, I, I also think the two game changes that strategists would need to take into consideration. One is that it's not clear exactly how Turkey is going to carry itself once it gets the leverages it will get if things go the way the, that, that is planned right now. Um, if, if a threat by the Shia uh, bloc reduces, if, if Tanap is built, if Russia gets a little bit less um, uh, capable, <laughs> um, then you know, what is Turkey going to do with those leverage? I don't think it's very clear. There's already a process where Turkish democracy is undermined by, um, by its strategic importance um, in, in that um, uh, I, I think a very powerful um, government and power consolidation, which is necessary for Turkey to take advantage of its current historic opportunity, also has negative effects on Turkish democracy. And ultimately, Turkey's soft power in the region or its attractiveness in the region is very much tied to its dem democratic performance. So I think that's something to keep in mind. It's something that the European Union would probably be in the forefront of, 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 of um, uh, ensuring. And that with a with lack of a EU integration process, I think there are more question marks about how Turkey will use its strategic uh, 
position uh, in, in the future, also taking into consideration the leanings of the government and the leanings of the public opinion. In conclusion, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Um, I'm okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there, I think there are a few critical years ahead of us, and, and the U.S. engagement in these critical years is, is key. For one, it's TANAP, it's the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline. Uh, until, I think, until that's um, secured, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Azerbaijan, on Georgia, on Turkey, um, coming from the north and the south. Um, and so, you know, I think, I, think, I think it's a critical period for that. 2015 is a critical period critical period. It's the uh, centenary of 1915, and there'll be a lot of, uh, of pressure on Turkey in uh, sort of facing up with its own historical um, uh, wrongs, and you know, how that's going to translate into the triangle of Turkey-Azerbaijan-Armenia relations is important. Um, and I, for one, uh, am, am think the pressure should be on Turkey in the sense of dealing with its own history as opposed to making geopolitical sacrifices. It's not about geopolitics, it's about, it's about history, it's about rights, it's about democracy. Um, and I think that's where the focus of the pressure on Turkey should be. I think it's critical also because Georgia has a new government and bringing Georgia into the, in the, into the fold is, um, is, is going to be a process and the Turkey-Azerbaijan-Georgia integration process is very important in terms of, of what we're talking about, Iran. I, I would wish that Armenia would also be in that fold, but even if Armenia isn't, or can't be, you know, it has to go on. You know, the, the, we can't, um, I don't think it's, it's a good idea to not continue with integration in the region because you can't all be on board right now. The Kurdish settlement in Turkey, uh, very important. Um, uh, that, I think, will determine Turkey's strength in the region, Turkey's capabilities in dealing with its uh, neighbors, including Iran, and maybe first and foremost, Iran, right, to... Uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, but uh, like I said, once, once that problem is resolved or once it proceeds in the right direction, let's say, then you'll also have a Turkey that's, um, that's much more powerful than it is today, which is also worth thinking about how to check and balance. Thank you. Okay, great. We've got um, about 45 minutes for questions because we were one panel short, so hopefully we can have um, good discussion here. Um, I would just like to remind all of our audience members uh, to please keep your interventions short and please keep them in the form of a question, okay? Uh, so with that, uh, let's get going. Uh, yeah, here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, and usually please identify after, yourself again. Well, I'm still Hovannes Nikogosian from uh, Duke University. <laughs> Um, usually after either uh, Nigar or, or Sergey speak, I have much less to add or, or comment. But today I'm um, kind of, um, I was looking forward to see three uh, following uh, observations which I have been making about the uh, discussion today. And I will be uh, really much appreciating if you can um, say whether I'm um, talking nonsense or not. Uh, but the first uh, observation of mine uh, rega regarding the role of Iran and the iranian uh, Zeri relationships in the uh, region, I, my observation is that since uh, the early 90s and dissolution of the Soviet Union, the biggest ever contribution of Iran to the uh, regional security was the blanket rejection of religious layers in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and which is much better, in my observation, in my assessment, uh, contribution to the uh, regional peace rather than its detailed uh, position regarding uh, the uh, the conflict itself or siding with either of the uh, three sides of the conflict etc which leads me to a second observation um, adding uh, to your point about peacekeepers Sergey that um, ever since 19, uh, 1994 the ceasefire was established in the Gorna Karabakh front line the uh, Iran continued its role as a status quo power in the, uh, in the, in the region, uh, which was much more than the uh, rejection of peacekeepers or its own understanding who shall be the peacekeepers in the right um, uh, shores of the Araxes River. And I maintain that the Ira absolutely uh, the Iranian position regarding the conflict is that it, it is benefiting the Armenian control of the uh, border regions uh, um, uh, bordering regions from the Araxes River, bordering to, uh, to Iran, as long as it is not, not um, uh, militarized in a hostile way towards Iran, given its international uh, standing. Which leads me to a third conclusion, 
that Iranian continuing talks about its readiness to mediate the conflict are at least not genuine. And I'm uh, looking for, I, I'll be looking forward to have your comment whether how, how you look at Iranian um, efforts to meddle into uh, in, into the conflict and arrange some mediation uh, and and uh, and and the follow up. So uh, these are the three observations which I'll be very much appreciating your your, your comments, if any. Thank you. Okay. Do you wanna? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, this is why, as far as I understand, you uh, proposed us to make comments on comments. I was just, uh, Our observations on your observations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Weird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first one on the uh, ratio between uh, nationalism or national egoism and religious factor. I completely agree that many uh, aspects of the Iranian foreign policy are predetermined not by a religious factor, but uh, factors of national egoism and uh, desire to play a role of regional uh, power in the South Caucasus, first of all in the Middle East and in Central Asia. I uh, wish to remember one more example uh, and add to your uh, row of examples. Uh, mediation of Iran in the Tajikistani civil war. The first agreement on ceasefire was made in Tehran in 1994. The final uh, ceasefire agreement uh, was signed in Moscow in 1997, July. But the first one was orchestrated by Tehran. And uh, I could agree with you that the religious factor is used, but instrumentally. The most important thing is uh, national egoism and national desire. Uh, as for religion, don't forget that Iran is a multi-ethnic country, and religion uh, factor, a religious factor, as well as previously factor of Shah, could be considered like a unifying factor, factor for strengthening identity, because without any uh, unifying factors, What's about the territorial integrity and so on, so on, so on. Uh, the second point on uh, yeah, yeah. As for status quo power, thank you for uh, reminding me. I uh, missed this uh, very important topic. Uh, in, in in this way, by the way, uh, Russia and Iran uh, look like. Uh, uh, the, the, the same powers, powers uh, desiring to have uh, status quo as the best option. Because uh, many uh, people uh, stressed uh, similarities in approach of Iran and Russia, but uh, forgot that Iran uh, publicly rejected the idea of recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, by the way. In, in this situation, paradoxically, Iran is on the one side with the Western countries and the most countries uh, rejecting the recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And in this way, uh, status quo is the best option for both powers. Uh, and third uh, observation. I think for, for, for Iran, peacekeepers themselves are not treated like a uh, real threat. Uh, penetration of foreigners. A special concern of Iran is paid to three powers, non-regional powers. United States, United Kingdom, and Israel. And those countries are specially suspected by Tehran in, in the region. Okay. Um, this is why not peacekeeping operation itself, but penetration. Oh, of yeah. Sorry, did you want to add something to that? No, I mean, it's a, just the, by and large, your point, I, I think, is that in a sense, the continuation of the conflict as it is is in Iran's interest. I would definitely agree with that. I would also think it's actually I think the country with the most to gain with the resolution of the conflict is Turkey. Um, not that Turkey, you know, is able to make that happen, but I think Turkey is the most to gain with it. I also think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia as well. Turkey is probably the most again, which, which in a way is ironic. Okay. Um, let's go here. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions to Mr. Markidonov. The first is uh, <coughs> on the Iran issue again that a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but some Russian analysts say that 
in, in terms of relations with, uh, between Azerbaijan and Iran, the more Iran pressures on Azerbaijan, the higher the chances that Azerbaijan will shift towards the West. So there is a sort of a contradiction in this uh, triangle, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan. <coughs> and the second, so what do you think about that? The second is that Mr. Putin several times mentioned that if something goes wrong on the border with uh, Iran and Azerbaijan, so there is no other chance for Azerbaijani potential refugees but to move to Russia. So that's also a rationale behind the Russian activities. And the, the third question is, you remember that when uh, Iranian press and analysts were talking about the green pine systems sold by Israel to Azerbaijan, there was a big issue. Uh, and, uh, and Russian analysts also joined that. And the fact was that they were saying that these systems are sold again, uh, sold to Azerbaijani side again as Tehran. But nobody said that a year and a half before, S-300 was sold to Azerbaijan, which hadn't been sold before to Iran. So it sounds like Iranian aircraft could be shot only with Israeli aircraft, anti-aircraft systems. But Russian analysts didn't mention about 300, S-300. And uh, one more comment concerning the religious factor. Well, uh, that's right that Iran uh, shows that in terms of South Caucasus policy, religion is not that important for it. Although some other parts of the conflict uh, in Karabakh don't. I, I can bring an example, as Mr. Sarkisyan said to his Serbian colleague, that by supporting Azerbaijan, you're throwing the crosses that are on your chest under your legs. So this is a rhetoric which uh, tries to bring the religious factor to the front of the conflict. Thank you. It's, it's, it's time to start answering. Uh, the first... <laughs> The first issue, uh, I am not overestimating the uh, Western-Russian uh, geopolitical dimension in the relationship between Azerbaijan and uh, Russia. Because uh, some Azerbaijani analysts try to uh, stress the uh, pro-Western character of the Azerbaijani foreign policy. It's much more complicated. For me, uh, the Georgian T-shirt is uh, so small for Azerbaijan. And I think that any uh, reproducing of the Georgian experience for Azerbaijan uh, wouldn't be so good. First of all, uh, many experts uh, in Azerbaijan and outside of this country stress on the strategic cooperation between Israel as the most reliable partner of the U.S. in the Middle East and Azerbaijan. But uh, those relationships are strictly limited, first of all, by domestic policy agenda. You know about some stories on hijab, some meetings, uh, rallies, and, and, and so on. It's, it's the uh, first restriction. The second restriction is a uh, relationship between Baku and Palestine administration. It's a very sensitive point for Israel and the support of uh, Palestine future state is a very important, very sensitive for Israel, and it's the second restriction. The third restriction is uh, the strategic cooperation between Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan. You know that uh, just today Turkey uh, has reconsidered its role, its position in, uh, in the uh, Middle East and uh, in the South Caucasus, because previously Turkey uh, was... Uh, uh, older brother of Azerbaijan and younger brother of NATO and United States. Nowadays, the situation is much more complicated. Turkey pretends to play a role of self-sufficient Eurasian power, and this is why it uh, has provoked some problems, tensions with Israel, and it's also a factor of influence for the uh, Azerbaijani foreign policy and elaboration of agenda for this country, and also kind of restriction, and uh, some uh, many other problems. In terms of uh, democracy and human rights, Russia is much more reliable partner for Azerbaijan. The problem of succession, by the way, it's also so sensitive for the West, especially for the European Union. Of course, oil factor is so important, and sometimes it uh, overshadowed, uh, mm, how to say it in politically correct uh, terms, uh, some uh, ambiguous things of the domestic policy of the country. But anyway, those problems are not ignored. For Russia, uh, those problems are not so important. Let's remember the results of uh, previous presidential elections, 
where Mr. Rushaila recognized their results before the official statement of uh, the Central Electoral Committee of Azerbaijan. It's also good. And from time to time, uh, the highest rank officials of Azerbaijan criticize uh, uh, the West for the violation of sovereign democracy. I could uh, remind you some statements of uh, Ramis Mikhtiev, who is uh, man number two in Azerbaijani hierarchy, who criticized Kandaliza Rai or some statements of uh, another official, uh, officials of the United States because uh, our country, sovereign country, was the problem. We are strategically important, and uh, please deal with us. We, we are so, so important for you also. It's also your interest to have us, because in 2006, Azerbaijan was the second country after Turkey, which was called here in the uh, uh, United States as an uh, Islamic ally of United States. Previously, only Turkey was granted this title. Azerbaijan was the second country, and uh, taking into account uh, the uh, rate of popularity of United States in the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Their strategic partnership with Azerbaijan, it's, it's, it's tending to zero, maybe below the zero in, in this part of the globe. And in, in this situation, it's, uh, it's good to have such partner as, as Azerbaijan. But on another problem, don't forget about public opinion in the West, which is more important than both in Russia and Azerbaijan, and some other, some other factors. This is why uh, Azerbaijan is interested to have Russia as a counterweight, or the Islamic world also, as a counterweight, taking into account very serious problems with a search of identity, religion, a religious revival within Azerbaijan. As for pipelines, uh, I am not a great expert because I think, honestly, uh, in order to be expert on pipelines, uh, it's necessary to have two educations at least, physics and ec economics. I am not a specialist in physics and economy. I know that many uh, guys, both in Russia and the West, uh, like to speculate about the wars of pipelines and so on. I think that uh, it's an uh, extremely politicized topic here and, and, and in Russia. I think it's uh, possible to uh, make some big gains in this area. Uh, yes, in, all the way in the back. Uh, Stanley Kober, um, a few weeks ago, the Saudis rolled up an operation in the east of their country. Um, the indications were they thought it was an Iranian attempt to stir up the minorities uh, there. Uh, their reaction seems to be, if that's the Iranian game, we can play that too. I'm looking at an article um, from the Arab News of Saudi Arabia from April 7. The convening of conferences for people from Awaz who have demanded independence from Iran should not be seen as an isolated incident. While Iran is a modern country, it is also a vulnerable one that is subject to disintegration and destruction. There are a number of indicators that ethnic national groups are waking up in Iran, which may create a new reality in Iran. Um, if the Saudis decide they're gonna stir up or try to stir up the Azerbaijanis in Iran, what are the implications of that for the region? Yeah, historically, Saudi Arabia is well known to be a uh, opponent of Iran in terms of religion, in terms of uh, geopolitical interests, and, uh, and so on. But uh, speaking about uh, potential uh, challenges of uh, destruction of uh, Iran or partition of this country or creation of new realities, I am so skeptical. We spoke about the uh, Azerbaijani community in Iran, but don't forget that for Iranian-Iraqi war, many operations were waged on the territory inhabited by Azeris, and many of them defended their countries and were awarded by the medals and honors of uh, the country. And uh, the uh, policy of Iran is not so simple. Uh, many Iranian analysts uh, specially try to uh, uh, stress, to underline the role of uh, different uh, ethnic groups for the uh, creation of their country, including Azeris. 
yes, there are some tensions, problems, and uh, kind of uh, discrimination, but uh, this policy is much more complicated in the country. I'll, I'll add a few sentences. I think, you know, given uh, the fault line shifts in the region, I think there's a lot of sectarian and ethnic provocations that are going on, which is one of the reasons why Turkey really had to urgently take this Kurdish, its own Kurdish minorities issues uh, into, uh, into its own hands out of concern that these kind of uh, uh, divisions can, can also jump into, into Turkey. I think Turkey is an interesting issue when it comes to that, the particular interesting actor when it comes to the question that you posed. And there was a visit of the Turkish president to, um, to Tebriz in Iran in 2011, and he was met with overwhelming uh, celebratory uh, uh, and embracement by the Aziris of, of, of Iran. And it really sort of created um, tension or concern about whether uh, Turkey might play a role in um, activating uh, that uh, community. But Turkey is extremely cautious about this and extremely uh, hands-offish. Uh, and, and, and so I think, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, caution will prevail when it comes to the Turkish uh, stance about the ethnic Aziris in Iran. Okay, thank you. Uh, is this a two-finger question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, it's a oh okay. Um, do you mind if we come back to you? Um, okay, yes, over here. Uh, my name is Kamal Makil Alif. I am from the Center for Strategic Studies, Azerbaijan, and my questions will be to Mr. Markedonov. First of all, small comment on uh, uh, actually the uh, Israel-Palestine obvious issues. Uh, we do have an excellent uh, state of relations with Israel, but at the same time, it should not be forgotten that Azerbaijan also recognized Palestine as a state, and we have a cooperation with that, and we're part of a Muslim world, and this is also defines a little bit the situation that we're in. My question is actually uh, about what you mentioned as a uh, uh, pragmatism and approach of uh, Iran towards uh, its uh, policy on South Caucasus. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on the, what kind of pragmatical steps do you see coming from Iran, especially in light that when it comes to the, uh, its strategy towards Azerbaijan, you can see that the more Iran actually applies pressure and pushes uh, towards Azerbaijan, pushes us to the cooperation with its other partners, which Iran does not necessarily approve of. Thank you. First of all, I completely agree with your first thesis about uh, Azerbaijan as a part of Muslim world, and this is why it's a restriction for the strengthening or development of cooperation with Israel. Azerbaijan is a rather sophisticated country, uh, having uh, good relations with the West, with Russia, balanced relations. It's uh, not looking like Georgia, uh, but it, 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 it tends to uh, have uh, balanced relations with different centers of power. By the way, in, in, including uh, Iran, by, uh, Iran also. Don't forget that previous year, October, November, I don't remember exactly, but no November, uh, President Ahmadinejad visited Baku and contributed specially for their organization of uh, economic cooperation. And he said that uh, we, we are brothers, we are two uh, neighboring countries, and uh, the problem is uh, uh, outsiders try to make or provoke quarrels uh, between us and so on. And I agree with Alex Vatanka that relationship between Azerbaijan and Iran uh, look like up and down. It's, it's, it's combination. As for uh, uh, Iranian foreign policy, I'm repeating once again, this foreign policy is combination of loud revolutionary re rhetoric, some concern, threats, phobias, fears on Israel, on the West, uh, some conspiracy theories on the one side, and pragmatic approach. Let's see on the relations between Georgia and Iran. Georgia is considered to be like the most pro-Western country in the region. But it was not a real obstacle for Tehran and Tbilisi to restore direct flights between Tbilisi and Tehran, to open consulate in Batumi, the most beloved city of uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who used the city for his political advertisements and, 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 and so on. It was not a problem for Georgia to ask uh, Iranian foreign ministry on uh, engagement in uh, the peacekeeping format uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Tbilisi uh, 
permanently uh, provided consultations with Tehran and so on. It's, it's kind of pragmatism. And I uh, also address to the experience of Tajikistan, where national egoism, national interest uh, were uh, put ahead the ideas of religious solidarity or religious fraternity and, and so on. In the case of Azerbaijan, it's not, uh, it's not also so simple to estimate the uh, policy of Iran. Yes, of course, uh, there are some problems of uh, sheer identity and translation of it for former USSR uh, entity uh, controlled previously by uh, Little Satan. Big Satan is here, but Little Satan was in the USSR. Don't forget about it. Uh, national, uh, national interests first. It's, it's not bad, it's not good. And uh, I, I, I also could completely agree with uh, Alex Vatanka that uh, uh, if in the case of Russia we are discussing the different towers of Kremlin, in the case of Iran we could also discuss different schools like towers competing each other. Okay. Um, Andy, did you want to jump in now? Or? Um, thanks. Uh, there's been a, a, a fair amount of discussion today about the possibility of, of domestic instability in Iran. Um, there hasn't really been any discussion about the, the potential for domestic instability in Azerbaijan. And I was wondering if uh, our panels could address uh, how they see that potential from the perspectives of, uh, if you can, Turkey, Russia, and Iran, if possible. Uh, there's been some talk about the uh, Iranian attempts, uh, you know, to maybe not to catalyze uh, their um, Islamic groups, presumably in the south of Azerbaijan. Uh, there's been evidence, however, as well, though, of uh, cross-border um, Islamic groups uh, coming from the North Caucasus into Azer Azerbaijan. You know, how, how, danger is, how dangerous potentially is the Islamic factor for Azerbaijan? Or, uh, and or, uh, how, danger is the po how dangerous is the possibility of, of a more Arab Spring-like um, event in Azerbaijan, uh, starting from more social economic issues or some combination thereof. First of all, I uh, don't believe that Arab Spring is a virus. I don't believe that it would be automatically transfer from uh, Syria, Egypt, or some other Arabic countries to Azerbaijan. Uh, for uh, any change or any uh, negative dynamics, first and foremost, uh, this country uh, would have to have uh, prerequisites for the uh, such for, for such scenarios. Speaking about uh, windows for. Uh, opportunities for uh, destabilizations. Uh, let me uh, make some general general observations on the Azerbaijani uh, domestic policy. Uh, I, th I hope my uh, honourable colleagues would not be against <laughs> my uh, small intervention on this topic. On uh, one side, a situation in uh, this republic looks like predictable and stable, and uh, unlike some stereotypes. Uh, Ilham Aliyev proved to be uh, not only uh, the son of great uh, father, he uh, was very effective, uh, really uh, faced to uh, some challenges of uh, colored revolution in 2003 to, to 2004. And uh, the problem is not only authoritarian methods of Ilham Aliyev, he has real resources of popularity in this country because many people really uh, compare situation in Azerbaijan not with principle of uh, 1776, but with realities of the early 90s in this country. And this comparison is in favor of uh, Haidar Aliyev and Ilham Aliyev. Maybe the price of question is uh, uh, disputable. But don't forget that uh, opposition, secular opposition in Azerbaijan is weak not only due to repressive policy. It's weak uh, by, by itself, by default, like Russian opposition or some other opposition in the post-Soviet countries. Because uh, those guys wage war not only uh, against uh, the current uh, leadership, but between each other. 
who is the uh, best opponent of the current regime, and, and, and so on and so on. This is why they failed and fail uh, right now. The problem is not only a uh, repressive policy, I'm repeating once again, but resource of popularity and the weakness of the secular opposition. But it's only one side of the coin. But another side is absence of uh, real opposition, secular opposition. Practically, it's zero, uh, tends to be a zero below the zero. But the problem is real presence of uh, protest uh, aspirations or uh, pro critical estimates of the situation, connected with corruption. Uh, recent story with Ismaili raised this problem. Even Ilham Aliyev was forced to uh, press on the local uh, head of administration to resign because his relative was engaged in the scandal and he was so arrogant in his uh, attitude to, to the local population. Previous year incident in Guba, the northern part of uh, Azerbaijan, took place in this republic. This is why there are some protest uh, views or opinions, but no leaders. And in this situation, uh, the problem of bazaar and mask is really uh, dangerous. Because this uh, uh, environment, not right now, but maybe in mid, uh, short, uh, maybe long-term perspective, uh, would try to privatize those views to uh, grant some benefits from this situation. Because uh, you know that uh, radical Muslims uh, are eager and uh, love to work with the problem of social injustice, corruption, social division, and, and, it's, and so on and so on. Speaking about radical Islamism in Azerbaijan, we could uh, talk about two parallel waves or uh, groups of ideas. The first one, as uh, my colleagues uh, rightly noted, uh, is connected with Iran. But uh, this uh, group of the people and ideas uh, predominantly concentrate in the southern part of Azerbaijan, Linkaran and so on. Visit Linkaran and uh, you could uh, feel a serious difference between Baku and this part of the country. And another part is uh, connected with uh, uh, Salafis, Wahhabis, Sal uh, more or less moderate and jihadists. Uh, who are concentrating, first of all, in the northern part of Azerbaijan. Hachmas, Guba, Gusari, uh, territories with uh, lesbians. Those groups are not uh, so uh, good uh, integrated, uh, not only in terms of uh, Azerbaijani language, even in terms of Russian language. I traveled around those districts and try to ask questions in Russian. Only one uh, settlement was very fluent, Krasnaya Sloboda, populated by Jewish people. Uh, and uh, the impact of Russian Dagestan is uh, so serious. This is why one of uh, Azerbaijani human rights activists uh, uh, spoke about virus of Wahhabism. It, uh, relate, it was uh, connected with some attempts of terrorist attacks in 2006 in Azerbaijan. Uh, it, it's, it's good for this republic that those groups are not connected to each other, those potentials uh, are not united. And uh, even different groups uh, like Salafis or Wahhabis are organized due to uh, network principles, it's not CPSU, not vertical principle and so on. But any, anyway, uh, Dagestani part of the interstate border is very important. Don't forget, by the way, that uh, Russia became the first country uh, which delimited and demarked uh, interstate border with Azerbaijan. This problem is not resolved with Georgia, Iran, and Armenia, but with Russia this problem is resolved. It, uh, but at the same time, this problem uh, raised a huge wave of criticism in Russia, and especially in Dagestan, because of two uh, lesbian enclaves, Hrakhoba and Uryanoba, and uh, this problem is actively discussed. Uh, previous November, the government of Dagestan uh, made a resolution to launch the problem of uh, a repatriation of lesbians from Hrakhoba and Uryanoba to uh, the territory of Dagestan. 
And uh, it's interesting that uh, Russia, which is so uh, suspicious to any regional uh, initiatives and attempts, uh, closes eyes for uh, cooperation between Dagestan and Azerbaijan. Russia is appreciated the development of cooperation and exchange of delegation between Makhachkala and Baku. And here the personality of Aliyev, who was uh, a relative of uh, Aliyev's family, and uh, in the period of World War II, uh, he was the first secretary of Dagestan Abkom Party, uh, Abblasnoy, uh, regional committee of uh, CPSU, and uh, it's also considered like symbol of uh, good relations and friendship between Dagestan and Azerbaijan. This is why there is another dimension of uh, Russian-Azerbaijani cooperation, Dagestani border and uh, regional engagement of uh, the Dagestani government in this situation. I think it's very useful. And th this is why Russia is interested to have a swing policy in relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Of course, Armenia is military, politically uh, a lie, but at the same time, uh, Armenia and Russia don't share the common border, Azerbaijan and Russia uh, do. And uh, the problem of the Dagestani party is crucially important for the security of two countries. Um. I'll try to complement a few of the points already made. One is that Turkey is playing a role in a way in counterbalancing um, the effect of radical uh, Islamist groups in Azerbaijan. Not Turkey per se as a state, but Turkish religious mm -hmm. uh, groups or networks are quite active in Azerbaijan. And they're also very... Um, mm, uh, they're, they're very non-confrontational when it comes to the government and the administration. So they, they're really working the, the field more um, and, and trying to get a different, um, uh, you know, one, one uh, or pursuing their own uh, interests, but also um, a more, much more moderate uh, version of, of Islam, and making it more appealing to the Azeri people who are actually drawn to it from a Turkish source much more than they would be from um, uh, an Arab or, or otherwise. And that because of the the affinity of the two societies, the Turkish export actually ends up sticking a little bit more, and it also helps that it's more moderate, so it's easier to stick in a relatively secular uh, country. Oh, this, sorry, this includes, uh, uh, Gulen movement? For, first and foremost, the Gulen movement, which is quite active in, in Azerbaijan. Um, uh, I, I mean, just to, to make a point about uh, your question, I would say in Turkey's case, at least, and the same thing I think is true for a number of other Western countries, that the geopolitical importance of the current regime in many ways is uh, in the forefront, and that the concern would be that if anything were to change, if any other strong man were to come, it would be much more risky that it would be more anti-West, and if there was a fractured political situation, then that would also be risky. In, in terms of its ability to be manipulated or lack of ability to get things done and, and pursue a vision. So I think that geopolitical priority is trumping other considerations in the case of Turkey and, and a number of other countries. Where this isn't taking place is some European platforms, which are much more normative in their approach. Um, uh, uh, but then the leverage of the European Union or European countries over Azerbaijan is relatively low, no less because the carrots that they offer are not clear or not necessarily needed by Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has the resources for, 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 for one and is able to also balance Russia and, and, and Turkey and whatnot in a way that Georgia wasn't able to, thus needed the EU more. Uh, so I think, I think pressure on this, on this issue is not necessarily um, uh, effective. Um, uh, it's also, of course, a problem of how Europe's general problem of how to deal with these issues in its neighborhood also reduces the credibility of Europe in, in, in Azerbaijan, and that the Council of Europe is, is also not able to pursue its goals in other countries of, 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 the, of the region. Um, and, and lastly, what was not mentioned was economic resources. And I think that also plays a role in, in, in the continuing stability of the country, mm -hmm. because compared to the neighbors, compared to uh, other countries that have been through um, m more dramatic change, I think the, the, the resources are able to keep people much more um, comfortable. Okay, we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Fakhreddin Ismailov. Uh, 
Mr. Markadonov mentioned the problem of uh, delimitation in the Caspian Sea and the previous panel. Uh, Excuse me. Delimitation of the borders in the Delimitation Caspian. of the interstate border, not the Caspian Sea. Only interstate border between Russia and Azerbaijan. Okay, I take I mean, agreement of 2010. Okay, I'm sorry. September. I'm taking your presentation. So, okay. another uh, the uh, the previous panel mentioned of the mentioned about the military buildup in the in the Caspian Sea, taking into account the fact that only littoral countries, littoral countries have the access to the Caspian Sea. What uh, does necessitate this military buildup? And the second question: uh, Once this the delimitation of borders within Caspian Sea is 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 completed, can one imagine the uh, demilitarization of entire Caspian Sea? Thank you very much for your views on that. Thank you. I'm repeating once again, I mentioned the problem of interstate uh, borders. The limitation is for the Caspian Sea, it's much more complicated because uh, those relations are, or the, the, this issue is not limited by bilateral relations of two countries. You know that Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, and Russia are engaged in this uh, delimitation. And there are many problems, not only between Russia and another uh, actors of this uh, problem, but between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan, between Russia and Iran, and, 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 so, and so on and so on. I am not sure that this problem would be really resolved in the uh, short-term perspective. As for the Russian position, it's position of uh, the country or status quo power. Now, status quo is better than resolution uh, with uh, not taking into account the Russian injuries. And of course, Russia has a special concern about militarization of the Caspian Sea and penetration of uh, other actors. For example, in the uh, relationship to uh, with Turkey on uh, the Black Sea uh, issues, or set of the problem. Uh, Russia and Turkey are ready to be uh, guarantor of uh, joint stock venture of the Black Sea, uh, Convention of Montreal, and, and so on. In the case of uh, Caspian Sea, Russia is also preferring to uh, keep status quo, considering it like less evil in this situation. Okay, maybe one more question here. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, my name is Mindy Reiser, and I've worked in the region. We don't have the gentleman who would have said something about the Chinese interest in the region, and I know this is not necessarily your areas of expertise, but I'd be interested in any observations you might have on the role of China now and in the future. Good question. Uh, <laughs> just today, China is not so active in the, in the South Caucasus. Uh, first of all, China concerns about the Central Asia, because it, it borders on some countries, it borders on Afghanistan, it's uh, the key issue. As for uh, the South Caucasus issues, China addressed to them only for Shanghai cooperation, uh, directly addressed, of course. Uh, for the Shanghai uh, Organization Summit in uh, August 2008, when China rejected to recognize the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, as well as Kosovo, and so on. The position of China is understandable. We have some problems with territorial integrity. This is why we are not going to criticize you. Don't criticize us. This is why it was kind of position of China in uh, those uh, areas. Uh, I know that uh, China is developing some business contacts, and first of all, it stresses on the business penetration at first. I think uh, that in uh, South Caucasus, uh, the same scenarios in Central Asia would be uh, realized when not uh, ideas of geopolitics, but first of all, business interest would be at first. Uh, as for as for Iran, uh, it's uh, also it's also critical to the Chinese penetration because China is considered like uh, United States, United Kingdom, Israel as non-regional actor. This is why there is kind of fear, phobia on the Chinese penetration. Of course, yes, they they are ready to discuss something on uh, anti anti-Western ideas and so on, but not in their territory uh, having priority interest for uh, Iran in 
other case it would be considered like competitive interest. Finger. Yeah, I, I saw. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, it was my uh, initiative to uh, invite uh, Professor Lu Shang on the panel after having a long discussion with him, with him, with him about this. I'd make a couple of ob observations um, in representing myself and not, <laughs> not Lu Shang. Um, first of all, the, the, the Chinese-Iranian re relationship is very uh, deep and comprehensive. Uh, this is an important relationship uh, for for China for a number of a number of reasons um, energy uh, one of them for sure but not but not only uh, and it's uh, you know interesting to if you look at the comparison of let's say that the trade relationship uh, between Russia and Iran uh, which is quite minimal actually it's only about uh, three plus billion dollars a year the Chinese Iranian bilateral trade relationship is about 10x that uh, 30 30 plus billion dollars a year but I think more significantly maybe from a from a Mm, strategic standpoint, um, the uh, uh, China looks, when China thinks of Asia, they don't just think about East Asia as typically we Americans do. They look at Eurasia and uh, they look at uh, the importance of developing not only trade uh, but transit corridors uh, from China, Western China obviously, uh, through Central Asia into the, and into the Caspian area. Uh, to get them to the greater Middle East. Um, and so while the South Caucasus is, is not a significant, significant piece of this for now, it's part of this larger, larger whole. And uh, there are some interesting articles uh, that have come out from significant uh, Chinese uh, um, geopolitical and international relations thinkers, uh, one of them uh, by uh, Wang GC, based at uh, Beijing University, so that what while the United States is talking about its pivot to Asia, and again, while what we think of, the Americans think of Asia as simply as East Asia, uh, the Chinese should be thinking about their march west. Uh, and that ironically, when uh, the Americans are thinking about the pivot to Asia, they don't really think about if the pivot to Asia is about containing or managing the rise of China. Uh, Washington is not really thinking about what's north of China, what's west of China, and what's southwest of China. And so that maybe Beijing should counter uh, in a way that uh, uh, takes them to the, to the west. And this sort of brings in Iran and the Caspian region and, of course, Central Asia, as mentioned already by Sergei. Okay, I think that's probably a good way to pivot to our next conference. Um, but we're basically out of time. So once again, I want to thank you all for coming. And if you could, please give a round of applause to our speakers.